Welcome to the first EU Space Surveillance and Tracking webinar. My name is Nina Christensen, I'm Communications Officer at the EU Satellite Centre and I'm very pleased to be the moderator today. The objective of this webinar is to present the EU SSD capability and provide some information on how to access the different services, which are collision avoidance, re-entry analysis and fragmentation analysis. Now let's have a look at the agenda. After this welcome, you will be given an overview of the EU SSD support framework. Thereafter, there will be different presentations on the SSD services and the EU SSD portal. This is followed by a questions and answers session, and I encourage you to send us your questions through uh, the chat. Finally, we will have a wrap-up and conclusions. So, let me present you the speakers. To my right is Amélie Gravier. She works at the CNES and she is secretary at the EUSST Consortium for Space Surveillance and Tracking. She will be the one who gives you the overview of the EUSST support framework. To her right is Mr. Florian Delmas. He also works at CNES and he is responsible for the SST operations and services at the French uh, um, SST operations center. To his right is Cristina Perez. She works at the CDTI, and she's responsible for the SST uh, services and operations at the Spanish SST Operations Center. Together, Florian and Cristina will present the, um, the collision avoidance service. To my left is Paolo Nunes. He works at the EU Satellite Center, and he leads the implementation and management of the EU SST front desk and he will give some information on how to access the services through the USSD portal. Now, to his left is uh, Dr. Elena Velutini. She works at ASI, and uh, she is the co-chair of the technical committee of the USSD uh, consortium. To her left is Second Lieutenant Moreno Peroni. Uh, he works at the Italian Air Force, and he is responsible for the development and management of the Italian SST Operational Center. Together, Elena and Moreno will present both the um, reentry analysis service and the fragmentation analysis service. So, without any further ado, I will pass the floor to Amelie, please. Thank you very much, Nina. So, good morning uh, to all of you. So, my name is Amelie Gravier, as you rightly said so. Uh, I am the secretary of the USSC consortium and uh, today this is uh, my pleasure to give you this uh, general introduction uh, of this consortium. I will try to, to explain to you uh, who we are, where we do come from and how we are um, organized. Uh, so let's start uh, maybe with the, with the beginning, uh, which is uh, our foundation. So I would like to explain to you that uh, the USSC consortium is the result of a political decision which has been taken at the uh, European Union level. Um, there was a decision adopted by both the, the Parliament and the Council in 2014. This is decision 501 that you can see uh, on the screen. Um, and so you can <coughs> see that we are quite a recent creation. So since uh, 2014 and we started uh, performing the services in uh, 2016, so uh, about three years now. This decision 501 is our foundation which means that uh, we have been structured and organized starting from this uh, text. Uh, and it establishes a support framework, which is a bit different than a program like the other space programs. Support framework means that we should consist in uh, networking and in uh, using national SST assets in order to provide the SST services. And lastly, I would like to highlight that uh, the objective of the creation of this support framework is to help uh, the European Union to reach an appropriate level of autonomy in the SST domain. Um, I will probably not enter into the details of uh, all these slides uh, because in any case the functions that you see are described in, the, in my later slides. So maybe we can move directly to uh, our governance model and uh, you can see that we have put in place a quite, quite unique uh, governance model which is a consortium of member states. Uh, so there are eight member states uh, gathered, uh, the five historical ones, uh, let's say, which are France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and the UK. And they've been recently joined by Poland, Portugal, and Romania. 
uh, earlier this year, at the beginning of this year. And together we are forming the SST consortium. And with the SATSEN, uh, European Union Satellite Center, we constitute the SST cooperation and we work together. I need here to mention maybe one particularity of, uh, of this consortium, which is that we have to take into account um, an important or highly sensitive civil military nature um, of the SST domain. This is actually the raison d'etre of our consortium model. And this is why uh, from, uh, from each of the member states, as far as possible, inside our committees and our work packages and tasks, um, at all levels of the consortium, basically the delegates are coming from the space agency and also from the MOD as far as possible. Um, so I think this is um, what I needed to mention on the duality of the SSA domain. From this slide, you might see that there are various levels of governance uh, from the working level, the management level, and, and then the decision uh, making level. We have three main committees. Um, the steering committee, which is the highest decision making body of the consortium. Um, together with the European Union Satellite Center, we also form the coordination committee. Uh, there is also the security committee, which is in charge of security aspects linked to, um, to the SST activities, so ensuring the, the implementation of uh, the provisions on the use and secure exchange of data and information in particular. And then uh, we have the technical committee. We have Elena as co-chair uh, here. Technical committee which is in charge of the technical implementation of the SST projects. And, uh, and below that we also have a, a structure in work packages and tasks. Uh, lastly, on the right hand part, uh, part of the slides, uh, you will see that we have many links with different institutions at European level and also EU member states. Uh, we are regularly uh, explaining what we do and uh, our progress to the institutions uh, like uh, the European Commission, uh, the Research Executive Agency, the RIA, uh, and also to the 28 member states in Brussels. Now that I hope you understand a bit better how we are structured and who composes this consortium, uh, I will work, I, I will present you uh, maybe in more detail how we work on a daily basis. Uh, so you will see on this slide uh, the three functions that I did not really enter into the details uh, at the very beginning of my presentation. The three uh, functions as defined per the decision 541, which are the sensor function, data processing and service provision. In this service provision model you can see them uh, represented. I will briefly present those functions and I will try to enter a little bit into the details. Of course not that much because for instance yeah. for the services my colleagues here will, uh, will uh, of course, present you with much more detail what I, than, than me. Um, I have to mention, first of all, that uh, some of those functions remain or remain in the remit of the member states, uh, whereas some others uh, are really done at, let's say, in a cooperative way, in cooperation among all the uh, USST member states. So, for instance, the sensors and data processing functions are currently in the remit of the member states' activity. This means that um, actually the decision 541 is clear. It says that uh, member states should retain ownership and control over their own assets um, and they also build the national catalogs. So this is the part which is in the remit of, of the member states. However, um, there is an ongoing activity at EU SST level um, to create and set up a European database uh, because we understand that we have a growing uh, network of sensors. Uh, we are now eight member states. So there are more and more European data available and it has to be shared uh, routinely or quasi real time or on request depending on the sensor type. So we realized that we need, uh, that th there was a need to set up a dedicated platform for the ingestion and the exchange of data. So measurements for the sensors are fed into, stored in, and exchanged uh, via this database, which has been uh, operational since April this year. Um, it, there has been a huge uh, preparatory work, testing phases, but now this database is operational. And it's going to be also the starting point uh, for the building and maintenance of a European catalog of space objects, where the measurements data from the database can be uh, pre-processed, analyzed, correlated, um, and in order to refine the orbit uh, of, the, of the objects, to determine and to refine this orbit. So we are currently working on this next step, uh, this uh, initial phase of the catalog. 
Uh, and that lastly, on this, uh, on this part, on this graph, you will see the three services. So here I will not enter too much into the details because, again, my colleagues are there for that. Um, just to let you know that there is a pair of OCs. OCs means operational centers or operation centers. Um, so France and Spain are in charge of the collision avoidance service for the consortium. Uh, Italy is in charge of the reentry and the fragmentation service, services. Um, and of course, all the other member states uh, of the consortiums uh, and all the other operation centers remain prepared to lend support across uh, those uh, services should the need arise and uh, in an active and, and timely manner. So we, al we also have this offline analysis, which is important to extract lessons learned, progress collectively, uh, try to improve our services and our way of working. And so this way of working enables to have one single interface also with the users, with you basically, uh, and it answered a certain robustness of uh, the system structure. So um, now I will try to focus a little bit on each of these um, big, big functions. Um, you will see here on this slide um, our sensor network. So we have a, a sensor network composed of uh, surveillance radars, uh, tracking radars, laser stations, telescopes, um, which also for radars and for telescopes, they are survey and tracking assets. Um, so we are performing, you, you, you will see here huh, that they are mainly focused on the uh, European land, mainland territory, although we also have some other telescopes elsewhere in the world. Um, and we are currently performing inside the consortium architecture studies and simulations uh, by focusing particularly on the sensor layer. Uh, in the idea actually is to plan structure upgrades for specific sensors um, and optimize their use in our evolving network between, uh, particularly we have two dates uh, or two timelines. The first one is 2021 and the other is 2028 um, because we also try to, uh, to prepare the future. And so to this end, for this uh, analysis and architecture studies, sensors, both existing or, or in planning, uh, are examined uh, as part of an added value and optimization analysis um, in, uh, in order to determine which architecture would be the best one, offering the best value for money and the best performances for the, as a whole, operating as a network. And the idea is, again, referring to the, the objective of the decision 501, to increase this appropriate level of autonomy, which, uh, which was mentioned by the European Union. So this, is, um, a, this was a bit of a focus on the sensor network. Um, then, for the service uh, provision to the users, so the three services, uh, as per our funding decisions, are represented here on the slides. Again, uh, this is not my role today to enter too much into the details. <laughs> we have the experts all around. Uh, maybe simply to let you know about uh, briefly those services. So collision avoidance is the first one. Uh, it, assessed, uh, it provides the risk assessment of a collision, either between two spacecraft or between spacecraft and debris. And uh, there is a product associated to this uh, risk evaluation and also direct interaction with the, with the users themselves. Then we have the re-entry service. So re-entry provides uh, the risk assessment of an uncontrolled re-entry uh, of a spacecraft or of a debris uh, in the uh, Earth's uh, atmosphere. And again, we are providing a report with uh, all the available information uh, that we have to provide to the users. And the last uh, service is the fragmentation one. So it provides the detection and characterization of in-orbit fragmentation. Uh, so we try also to or break up or collisions and we uh, provide products in order to give you as much information as we have uh, on these events. Um, I think that's it for, for the services. Now, um, then after we have provided those products, they need to be transmitted uh, to the users, to you, basically. So um, you will see here on this slide uh, that we have an SST front desk, um, a service provision portal and SST front desk, which is under the responsibility of the EU Satellite Center. Uh, we will have uh, around this webinar many uh, occasions to understand a bit better how this service provision portal works and how you can have access to the services. Uh, so SATSEN has to ensure the, the direct and secure link with those users in order to provide added value, uh, high quality services, 
um, and it also supports the consortium uh, by providing statistics in order for us to understand what are the products that we, uh, what are the products downloaded, uploaded, so what is the activity on the portal and that helps us a lot to improve uh, the way we are working. Uh, so according to our funding decision again, and this is uh, in the right hand part of the slide, the services are currently uh, accessible to European users, including so users of the uh, European Union, including organs of the EU, uh, like the European Commission, the Council of the EU, the uh, European External Action Service, uh, research executive agencies, so there are many institutions that uh, receive our services today. Uh, also, public and private spacecraft owners and operators from the EU, um, European member states, and inside those European member states, uh, there are many institutions that can be concerned, like civil protection agencies, uh, research institutes, sometimes we also have uh, requests from the universities, and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, space agencies, that's, uh, that's obvious. So this is the list of, uh, of our users. Um, you can see, um, I think in the next slide, you will see an example of our various organizations receiving, this is not an exhaustive list, huh, but just to give you a flavor of uh, the diversity of our users. Um, I need to, to make a remark here, which is that uh, services are provided uh, free of charge and uh, on a 24 seven availability, um, thanks, to the, thanks to the portal. Maybe a few data, a few elements of statistics. So since the start of operations uh, in July 2016, um, the user update has grown and we currently have a total of 106 users registered from 60 organizations among the list that I just, uh, that I just mentioned to you in 18 member states. So this data comes from September this year. The Collision Avoidance Service has uh, 45 registered users. They belong from 22 organizations and uh, USST hence currently protects 129 spacecraft from the risk of, um, of collisions in all orbit regimes, uh, in LEO, in LEO and in GEO. Uh, these users again include European constellations uh, like the, the Galileo uh, navigation satellite fleet, uh, fleets by commercial communication uh, companies, providers, military assets or sp spacecraft operated by governmental entities as a whole. Uh, and then for the re-entry service, uh, there are 70 users from 46 organizations and uh, from the fragmentation analysis service, 60 users from 39 organizations. So these numbers have been growing and uh, again, we are trying to improve the way we are providing the services in order to answer your needs. Um, and uh, I think my colleagues will present you in more details in which way we can also adapt to some of your needs. So now the next step for you is to uh, basically, if you are an entitled user, according to this decision 501, uh, is to register to the service if this is not done yet. So uh, I will not, uh, again, I think Paolo will present that much more uh, in detail than that I can do. Um, but just for you to know, uh, you, will, uh, you can see here on the slide the link toward the EU SST portal. Um, and you will have to fill in a form if you click on create an account here. And you have on the top right all the information and description of the service, also the possibility to reach the front desk and the help desk. So um, I think that that is all for me. You, you have all the links here. You will hear us many, many times mentioning this USSD portal. So I hope I have given you a general overview of who we are. And now this is time for a more detailed presentation of each service, I guess. But uh, I will give back the floor to, to Nina first. Thank you so much, Emily, for this introduction. Now we will move on to presenting the Collision Avoidance Service, which will be done by Florian, Florian and Cristina. Please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Florian Delmas from CNES. So the Collision Avoidance Service provides a risk assessment of collision between spacecraft or between spacecraft and space debris, and uh, the generation of collision avoidance products. It consists in processing all available information, concluding with the provision of products derived from the detection analysis of high interest events, which are events which require further analysis and which may require mitigation action due to the high uh, level of risk. The, it also consists, uh, we also have the interest event which are events which, which require high um, further analysis. And then info event, 
which are low level, um, uh, which have a low level of risk, and uh, which typically are events which were in the past of high interest or interest. These events are categorized according to criteria defined with the users and reflected in the service configuration document, VSCD. So, uh, the service, the CS service is provided on the HOT 106 scheme by uh, France and Spain uh, to allow a more robust uh, provision model. Um, in some cases, a third OC, as, uh, known as callback OC, can have a whole visibility on the whole processing chain, but do not intervene. Uh, so the two OC received the same information from uh, the users and from um, uh, the USCC cooperation. Uh, so we received data from um, sensors contributing to USCC. We ingest them into our national database. We built a catalog. We screen them against the ephemeris provided by the users through front desk. And we upload, produ we upload the products uh, to, the, uh, to the front desk for the users. In case uh, of a HIE, typically a direct interaction between the OC and the user will be set in place and to have a more reactive um, communication. Uh, so, uh, yes, as Amelie said, in case of a high interest event, there is an OC in charge, but all of our country will uh, contribute um, to this event, in particular by providing measurements. So, to start the CS service, the users and um, the OC needs to, uh, set in to set in place several things. The first is to agree on a service configuration document, which will define the interface and the threshold of uh, high interest and interest event. The user needs to upload the ephemeris uh, to the USSD portal. And the user needs to grant the access to its, CDM, to, to its uh, 18th SPCS CDM to the user, to the OC. These are the requirements to, set the, to start the service. Uh, so, at OC level, we manage several um, data sources. So, some comes from the 18th SPCS, the CDM, and the uh, SP catalog. We use, uh, the, of course, the ephemeris from the users directly, and then, on, uh, I will come to it later, to generate uh, abacus uh, of covariance. And we use uh, measurement from the USST uh, sensors. Uh, for the primary and the secondary, uh, we need to define the hard body radius for both objects, for both conjunction. So we have information, from, of course, from the users, directly from the, from the SCD. We can take into account uh, other information, such as attitude information, to refine the hard body radius. We have, uh, for secondary, information of, of, of on size, either from the 18 SPCS or from ESA Disco database. Uh, so we mix uh, all of these sources of data to generate um, and uh, four different kinds of CDM. Uh, I will not detail uh, them today, uh, but uh, yes, I will not detail uh, them today as they are displayed on the screen. Uh, the USCC products uh, include so, um, event and product in the identification, including its severity level, for instance, alert or, or, or info the product question date, the time of closest approach, uh, the source of information used, the event characteristics such as, such as the missed distance or the probability of collision, and uh, mitigation support. Uh, we, you will find in the products uh, more, inf more information 
and uh, these, these products are, detail, are provided in, the, in two forms. First into CDM, which is the CCDS standard, and into also into a form of a PDF report associated to each CDM file. Uh, let's have a look on uh, covariance tab, Abacus generation. So we received uh, every day ephemeris uh, from the users, and we can compare statistically uh, the orbital difference between the prediction and the observed orbits. So uh, one day we have a prediction, the next day we have um, a determination, a determined orbit, and by accumulated all orbital difference, we can do uh, a statistical comparison. And then we uh, then we use this comparison to generate the covariance abacus. Uh, then uh, the main threshold, the main criteria uh, to define. Uh, High interest event and the uh, interest event uh, is the probability of collision. It can be, it can be also um, used in conjunction with uh, missed distance and radial missed distance. But to compute POC, so we use the covariance uh, extracted from our abacus. We use the hard body radius provided uh, by the user, but which can be refined if more information was provided. We use the hard body radius from uh, the secondary we computed. And then uh, we apply scale factor on the covariance to compute uh, scale POC to perform the probability of collision sensitivity analysis. The aim is to, um, to ensure that a small variation of the covariance does not lead to a very high risk, uh, which could have been missed. Uh, then we so once a high interest event is detected and is confirmed, we can provide the user with mitigation maneuver recommendation. So we generate a mitigation maneuver abacus based on scale POC, miss distance, on radial miss distance, based on uh, time to TCA, and um, delta V in term in general in terms of semi-major axis uh, increase. So you have here uh, four abacus for scale POC, POC, radial mid distance, and mid distance, uh, which can be explained uh, offline if needed. And then I will give a floor to Christina, which will uh, present you a real event which happened recently. So good morning. Thank you, Florian. For your for your slides, I will try to illustrate uh, what you already explained with a real case. So first of all, I would like to thank you, Avanti, uh, for letting us present in this real case that happened uh, one month ago, more or less. Uh, it was between ILAS 4 and Horizon 16. Horizon 16 is a big payload that is drifting in in G orbit. So from time to time, we are able to 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 see it with our sensors, and this was a really nice opportunity to it. Uh, for the first time, we detected the event 30 day, 13 days in advance of the TCA. Uh, it was detected uh, using the owner operator orbit and the SP catalog from the US. And the first time we detected it was an alert level. So we decided to trigger the, um, we called for help. We decided to trigger the tasking request within the USA, with, with, sorry, within the USST. Um, we keep on monitoring the event. Uh, the next day, uh, the, the alert was uh, also a high interest event. It was alert level uh, still. So it was based on geometry. It was not based on probability of collision. The highest probability of collision we reached was the uh, time to TCA minus 12 days, and it was like um, minus 6. Uh, it was uh, minus 6, but based on the scale probability of collision. Uh, with a scale factors of four, so when you don't trust really the, the orbit determination and when you think that you don't have enough information, but it was the highest probability of collision that we reached. 
So the event was entirely and purely uh, alert level based on geometry, on this distance on, on radial distance. Um, 11 days in advance, we managed to produce our first uh, autonomous product based on our national catalog, but with measurements from, the, from all over the sensors. And uh, 10 minus 10 days, TCA minus 10 days, we received the first uh, USST tracking measurements that uh, you see in the slide that uh, we received measurements from almost all over Europe, but as well from, from a telescope overseas. Uh, this is not the only time that we received measurement. It was mm, time to TCA uh, minus time, 10 days, but as well we, we, we have been receiving these measurements for all the event. Uh, so we were lucky. We were not alone because as you can see, we have not received any CDM from GSPOC yet. Uh, all this information, these four days, was uh, entirely based on autonomous products. The first CDMs that we received from GSPOC were on uh, was two days before uh, the the uh, it was seven days before TCA. Uh, we contact GSPOC and they were experiencing some of anomalous uh, situation. So usually you receive uh, the first CDM ten days in advance, and the first one that we received in this case was only seven days in advance. So we have to trust our sensors and our orbit determination and the CDM from GSPOS confirm our sus uh, suspects, suspects. So we feel like more comfortable now that we know that the alert was really an alert. Uh, all this time we were in contact with the user, of course. Uh, we were like analyzing the possibilities and explaining uh, them the, um, the different product that we were uploading to the portal and the situation. Um, you see this is the, the, the misdistant evolution of the event. Uh, we went through all the event, uh, like monitoring closely, and four days uh, before the TCA, uh, um, we were cooperating with the owner operator and they decided to adjust some of the station keeping maneuver in order to avoid uh, the risk. So we arrived to the TCA day, so we decided to have a closer look at the, at the event. And okay, yeah, you will see Horizon 16 is the one that is uh, crossing by, and yes, you can breathe, because nothing happened at the end, <laughs> but it was really close this time. Uh, I was speaking that we were in close in, co in contact with the owner operator of the of the spacecraft during this uh, long 14 days of, uh, of analysis. Uh, we followed uh, two lines of working. The first one is uh, that we compute uh, possible future collision risks uh, with their ephemerides, with their new plan of maneuver. So we receive these ephemerides and we check that uh, they were good and they were not increasing the level of risk or they are not encountering any other collision in the way. And the second line is to support in the maneuver decision making, in the maneuver decision making process, uh, but it's, uh, the responsibility was solely and entirely for the owner operator of, this, of the spacecraft. We only recommend a maneuver and we only support the owner operator in this, in this decision making process. Uh, you see that we send daily an update of the information and daily an update of the maneuvers they, they, can, they can do. Uh, you see in the graphs that, uh, that uh, depending on the time to TCA they perform the maneuver, they will have to use some delta V for, the, for this, or so it's more suitable or not, and depending on this delta V, they avoid the risk to a higher level or to a lower one. Um, as I already mentioned, finally the user decided to adjust some of the station keeping maneuver that they were planning in order to mitigate the risk, and everything went well. So, hope you have enjoyed the real case. And now the floor is to Paolo that is going to explain how the user uh, has followed the events in, in the portal. Thank you, Christina. Um, I'm going to show you now uh, how to access um, this uh, uh, collision avoidance service uh, uh, information 
uh, that uh, both uh, Florian and Christine have been uh, describing, how to find this information in the uh, USST uh, service provision portal uh, after uh, registration and after being uh, um, uh, through an approval process that is, uh, that is needed. So this is the, um, the, the portal main page, what we call the, the, the dashboard. Uh, there are um, different sections. Uh, we have a top menu uh, with, um, uh, with access to the, to the different services uh, event pages. Uh, there is also um, on the, below it uh, a timeline uh, where a user can find um, the, um, the, the upcoming conjunctions uh, and also uh, upcoming um, re-entry events or past fragmentations if the user uh, has been uh, has requested those, uh, uh, those services. Um, by choosing one, one of the events uh, in the timeline, uh, we have a, a brief summary uh, in, that, uh, in that section that is highlighted now um, in the portal with some of the main information of the event, the identification of the, uh, of the primary, the, the TCA, um, so in this, uh, in this dashboard, uh, you can also find uh, more information about the CA service in this um, left, uh, left bottom list. Uh, this list presents the 10 upcoming um, conjunctions, uh, collision avoidance events uh, for the user's registered spacecraft. So this, uh, this information is always uh, pertaining um, to the spacecrafts that the user uh, has registered for the, for the CA service. Now, going into the uh, collision avoidance um, events, uh, events page, um, in this page you will see a list of, uh, of events, collision avoidance events, potential conjunctions um, for your, uh, your spacecraft. Um, this is uh, presented as a, as a table. It, uh, it presents uh, some of the information related with, uh, with the event itself like the, the severity of, uh, of, the, um, of the event in the current moment, which is based on the severity of the, of the last product uh, produced by the, by the operational centers. Um, also the, the time to TCA, the identification of the, of the involved uh, spacecraft in the, um, uh, in the conjunction, uh, along with, uh, with some other information like uh, the event characterization that Florian pointed out, uh, the uh, probability of collision or the missed distance. We can go into detail uh, into the products of, uh, of each event. I'm going to highlight this, uh, this particular one, which uh, by coincidence is uh, also involving the same spacecraft that uh, Christina presented a, a real case with a similar, but not the same uh, secondary object, uh, a space debris, also a, a Gorizon. So in the, in the products uh, page for, uh, for this uh, particular event, you can see um, the products that have been created by the operational centers, the CDMs and the, the CA reports that are available in the portal uh, for you to, to access, to see in this page or also to, to download them uh, and use them uh, offline in your, uh, uh, in your computer, in your, in your systems. In this uh, products page, um, there is some information that uh, is important to highlight, the time to TCA. Uh, which is also important to, to keep in mind. And, uh, for example, the, um, the, the severity of the, of the products, which uh, represent the, um, basically the risk of this, uh, of this event, uh, the identification of the involved uh, objects, and also the um, probability of collision, um, which is the scaled probability of, uh, of collision, as Florian uh, mentioned. Also the missed distance, the radial missed distance, and uh, also uh, if the, the products are autonomous. So basically, uh, the, if they have been produced uh, using data uh, coming from the USST contributing uh, sensors. So this is where uh, a user through this web interface can access uh, the products of, a, of a, a CA event and can see the information or download them. Now, I will show you also uh, how to upload some, uh, some information, some user data um, that uh, was mentioned before that is needed for the, uh, for the work, for the analysis of the, of the operational center. So in the top right, uh, uh, top right menu, we have an uploads um, uh, entry. 
which we can enter and we go to a page where manually a user can uh, upload their own files, uh, the, the ephemerides of, um, of the user spacecraft or any other file that the user considers that is uh, useful, helpful for the analysis performed by the operational centers. Um, it's important to, to, to mention that uh, OCs are automatically notified when a user uploads uh, a file. So they can immediately um, download it and consider it in, their, uh, in part of their, uh, of their work. Um, it's also important to, uh, to mention that uh, what I've been showing uh, uh, basically a user web interface where users can use a browser and browse uh, through, through the information, but there is also an application programmatic interface available uh, into, the, into the portal through which the users can um, integrate uh, their own systems or uh, automate their own, uh, their own processes, uh, retrieving uh, the CA service information from the portal in an automated way or uh, even automate the upload um, of uh, user data information into the, into the portal. So through this um, uh, REST API, it is possible to, um, um, to download all the CDMs or all the reports that have been uh, uploaded to a, to a particular um, CA event or it's also possible to uh, upload new, new files for the, for the OCs to work or even to manage uh, the files that have been previously uploaded. For example, if a, if a file has some kind of uh, um, error or something, it can be deleted and can be uh, uploaded again in a system-to-system system way, let's say, enabling uh, integration with, uh, with the user systems or, um, or processes. Um, in the dashboard, uh, use collision avoidance users can also uh, um, find uh, a link to the service configuration document that has been agreed with the, uh, with the operational centers that basically uh, describes uh, all the criteria to provide the, uh, the CA service. So in this, um, in this top menu link, uh, SCD, uh, you can download uh, the, the document that you have uh, agreed previously with the, uh, with the operational centers or DOCs can also, uh, with their accounts, um, do the same, download the same, uh, same, same document. So this is uh, basically uh, uh, the, the front page of, uh, of such uh, an example of such a uh, such document. In conclusion, for the, for the CA service uh, that um, with all that uh, we have been presenting. Uh, basically, it's a service provided uh, through a, a not redundancy uh, mechanism with uh, uh, two OCs, sometimes three involved. There is dire direct dialogue between the OCs and the users for high interest events when the risk is uh, uh, at the uh, highest level and needs to be potentially mitigated. Um, it's a user-oriented uh, service, so we have been presenting that the users can define their own thresholds um, and customize um, particularities of the service. So it's a user-oriented service. We, um, as much as possible, intend to provide autonomous products uh, to the users based on data um, gathered by the USST contributing sensors. Um, the products uh, provided to the users uh, are based on uh, standard formats like uh, CDM complemented by um, expert analysis reports, the CA reports that uh, I've been uh, mentioning. Um, it's important also to mention that uh, uh, DOCs are ready to support um, the operators on, uh, on defining or deciding on any potential uh, maneuver that is needed to mitigate um, the risk of collision, being the, the responsibility on the operator side to decide to move or not. And last but not least, um, all, the, all the SST information that the uh, operational centers uh, create and upload to the portal uh, is available either through a user web interface or the uh, uh, application programmatic interface that I've shown uh, in my previous slides. So this is the conclusion of the CA service. I pass the floor again to, to Nina. Thank you so much, Florian, Cristina, and Paolo. We will now start with the re-entry analysis service. So I give the floor to Elena. Thank you, Nina. 
Elena Bellutini from the Italian Space Agency and I'm going to present the characteristic of the reentry analysis service. First of all, um, this service coped with the risk of the uncontrolled reentries of the space objects and this is one of the objectives of the SST decision that Amelia has presented you at the very beginning of this uh, webinar. And the AOC in charge uh, analyzed all the related information regarding these uh, uh, uncontrolled space objects and provide the users with the related products. The objects that are monitored by this service are those objects that are expected to re-enter uh, within the following uh, 30 days. We apply uh, some criteria in order to actively monitor uh, the re-entry objects uh, basing on their characteristics. And in particular, uh, we monitor those objects that are, um, are RCS larger than one square meter, uh, objects with a mass uh, greater than two tons, and the rocket bodies. And uh, when we have a re-entry campaign, uh, we um, activate uh, all the sensors contributing to the USST uh, network, and in particular for the re-entry service, the contribution of the tracking radar is expected. Then the product uh, of the re-entry service, and in particular um, the 30-day re-entry list and the re-entry warning report are provided to the user according to their settings, personalized setting, the geographical area in the portal. Um, in the slide uh, um, is shown the provision mechanism uh, for the um, reentry service uh, and um, as you can see uh, DOC in charge uh, receives input uh, both from uh, internal uh, European partner and external partner. Uh, in particular the um, input coming from the 18 space squadron uh, comes in the, form, in the form of tips messages, uh, TLEs and uh, 60 day reentry list while uh, the input that comes from uh, the European partner are basically shared, uh, basing, um, basically shared on the um, European uh, database. When we have um, a reentry campaign, the OC in charge um, send a tasking requests to the other OC of the USSC consortium in order to have uh, additional data um, to refine the um, prediction of the reentry window and the predicted impact point and to produce uh, uh, autonomous uh, uh, products. Then uh, these products, as uh, you can see from the right part of the slide, the 30-day reentry list uh, and the reentry warning reports uh, through uh, the portal are provided uh, um, to the users in the, left part, uh, in the right part of, um, of the slide. And uh, now uh, Moreno uh, will explain, will show uh, which, is, um, which are these uh, products of the reentry service uh, in depth. Thank you, Elena. <coughs> Good morning, I'm Moreno Peroni and uh, I work for the Italian Air Force. Uh, so what you might expect from uh, the re-entry service uh, <coughs> as, a, as, as a registered user? Uh, we are going to filter the objects that are re-entering the atmosphere uh, following the filters and the criteria that uh, Elena was uh, speaking about before and then we try to characterize the object that we filtered and we try to assess the re-entry prediction uh, the re-entry epoch prediction uh, for uh, that particular uh, object. Uh, there are two main products that we are delivering to you and they are the 30-day re-entry list that is uh, like an overview, it's a, a large awareness, a global awareness of what is going on and what you should expect in the next month and the other one is the re-entry uh, reports. In the re-entry reports uh, we go deeper inside the event uh, giving you more details and more information about the event. Uh, then some time uh, for particular events uh, like uh, the re-entry of the Chinese station Tiangong-1 last year we are able to also give you uh, a dedicated web page where more details and more materials are available to you uh, like simulations or uh, even uh, more information like videos uh, and uh, things like that. Uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very good uh, part of the service because uh, it's not so common. Then going to the 30-day re-entry list, uh, it's uh, just a list of the objects that we are expected uh, to see re-entering the atmosphere in uh, 30 days, but uh, just from this uh, global information you can uh, uh, you can uh, retrieve some useful uh, data for your own analysis. 
for example, the main one for me is the maximum latitude of the object because from that value you can assess directly if, if your own country or if your area could be uh, affected by the re-entry. Uh, the other one is the window. The window, that, uh, the, the window will give you the information about the timing. So uh, those kind of information can just uh, uh, give you a global awareness of the, on, on the event and uh, let you uh, in some way be prepared to this kind of event. The next uh, product is uh, the, actually the re-entry report. So a few days before uh, the predicted uh, re-entry epoch, uh, we are going to deliver uh, some reports about, uh, uh, about the event itself. And you will find in the report more information like the uh, current re-entry uh, epoch, uh, the current state of the object, uh, of the orbital information of the object, like uh, the apogee and the perigee. So over time, you can assess uh, the decaying of uh, the apogee and the perigee. Uh, then we uh, also give uh, uh, more uh, information about the area of interest that could be affected by uh, the object uh, over time. And uh, that table is important for you because uh, is, uh, is able to give you uh, time and uh, geographically information. So you can also assess if inside the re-entry window, the current re-entry window report in the report, uh, your, uh, your own state uh, is affected by, by the re-enter. Uh, and then we also show you a couple of uh, images uh, with a zoom on the Europe landmass. Uh, although we, we are able to provide the service also for your uh, overseas territories, uh, like islands, uh, like uh, um, other parts of your state. Okay, um, for, uh, for a real case, we would like to present you the Tiangong campaign. At that time, the Spanish OC was in charge for the re-entry. They were able to produce uh, uh, 13 reports uh, on that particular case. Uh, among 13 reports, uh, you have to know that uh, six of those uh, were actually autonomous. So uh, for us, autonomous uh, means that uh, all the information uh, uh, were retrieved from USST information, so from sensor data and from inside the consortium. That's, that's a really good point to, to know. Uh, also in that case, we were able to uh, provide a dedicated web page for uh, this particular event with more uh, analysis and more data and more materials for you. And here, some nice videos that uh, are uh, uh, related to the Tiangong one. And uh, on the top of the slide, you could see probably one of the last uh, uh, picture of the Tiangong uh, before we entered the atmosphere in, uh, in 2018. Uh, they, they were filmed by our cameras in near a Doppler radar. And on the bottom, you can see uh, the, an animation of the orbit that were calculated by the Spanish Sea. Uh, util, uh, uh, by means of uh, orbital data retrieved from measurements uh, from uh, five different sensors uh, of the consortium. Uh, so you can see that this kind of information will arrive to you by means of the portal, and uh, they are probably not so uh, commonly available for, uh, for a user of this kind of service. And after that, I give the floor to Paolo for a better explanation of the portal part. Thank you, Elena and uh, Moreno. Um, now, as uh, I did for the collision avoidance service, I will show you how to retrieve the uh, re-entry service information um, through the USST service uh, provision portal. So again, to, into, the, into the dashboard, on the, on the top menu, we have a, a, a re-entries um, um, menu. Uh, if you click on it, you will see that uh, you have two entries. You have the 30 days re-entry list and the re-entry reports. So basically the, the products that uh, uh, were, uh, were just explained by, by my colleagues. Um, also in the dashboard, uh, through, the, um, through, the, through the whole page, you can see that on the, on the bottom right, 
uh, if there were, uh, at this case, there weren't any uh, upcoming re-entry events, uh, you could see them on that um, uh, table listed the, uh, the 10 upcoming or maximum 10 upcoming re-entry re events in the, um, uh, in the dashboard. Just an overview of the event itself. More details can, uh, can always be uh, seen in the re-entry events page as I will uh, show uh, right, right now. If we go to the 30 days re-entry list uh, uh, page, we can see, as, um, as Moreno explained, um, a list of objects that are uh, expected to re-entry in the, in the Earth's atmosphere within the next 30 days. So uh, we have a list of objects with their, uh, with their name, uh, their international um, uh, identifier, which kind of object are we talking about, if it's, for example, a payload or a, a, a rocket body. Um, the, the, the max latitude, mentioned also by, by Moreno, and the uh, predicted re-entry window. Uh, this predicted re-entry window um, is going to be uh, updated um, as soon as new 30 days re-entry lists are created by the operational center and uploaded into the, um, uh, into the portal. So during the 30 days before, um, before the re-entry, uh, um, roughly uh, every two, three days, a new re-entry list is, uh, uh, is available with updated information uh, on, the, on the objects that are supposed to predict to re-entry uh, in, um, in the future. In the portal, uh, in this page, we can also, we can also see uh, if we select one of the objects, uh, the evolution of uh, the, the re-entry window, the predicted re-entry window for this particular object along the time. So basically the predictions that were um, uh, part of each of the 30 days re-entry list uh, that were pushed. So we can see that normally uh, we start with a, uh, with a large um, re-entry window, which is gradually over time converging uh, to, the, to the final uh, predicted uh, re-entry uh, re -entry epoch. Through this page, it's also possible not only to see the evolution uh, of the re-entry window of uh, each of the objects, but to consult uh, the past uh, re-entry lists that were created and published by the uh, re-entry um, responsible operational center. Going into the, the re-entry events uh, page, uh, it's a similar page as for uh, collision avoidance with a list of, um, of re-entry events uh, where we can find uh, relevant information for, the, um, uh, for, the re for each of the re-entry events. Uh, there is an ID, there is uh, also um, uh, the time that uh, uh, is still remaining to the predicted re-entry epoch, the predicted re-entry epoch, also the predicted uh, re-entry window, window with the window uh, start and window uh, end, the identification of course of the, of the object that is supposed uh, to re-entry for each, uh, for each um, event. Um, if we focus uh, in particular on this, uh, on this event, this is basically the same event as, uh, that Moreno uh, presented, the real case, the Chinese space station Tiangong-1 that re-entered uh, last, uh, last year. Um, we can now see uh, the re-entry products that were created and uploaded to the, to the portal for the re-entry users about this, uh, uh, this, particular, um, this particular event. Through this page, uh, and also the, the, the re-entry events page, you can download these, uh, these reports um, so you can store them and uh, analyze them uh, off, uh, offline. Uh, you can also see more uh, uh, the, the details um, um, of, each, uh, of each product, which uh, updates, each new product updates the, 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 event, the event situation, let's say, with an update of the re-entry window, if, if it updates, of course, and uh, with an update of the re-entry epoch. Um, also, um, there is information, uh, the last report that is issued normally is, the, is the, what we call the DK report. So it basically tries to confirm, uh, if possible, uh, if it was possible to, to confirm the, um, the decay of, uh, of the object. We uh, uh, also mentioned here um, that uh, it was confirmed that uh, the object has, uh, uh, has decayed. Um, as, as it was mentioned before also by, by Elena, 
uh, for the reentry service, each user has the possibility to select some geographical areas uh, to configure the service. What does this mean? Uh, basically, the users are uh, uh, have at their, at, uh, at their disposal this, uh, this configuration page. In the top right menu in my profile, you can find uh, a tab which is uh, re-entry areas of interest. It's this one that we are uh, seeing now. And through this, um, through this page, users can select uh, EU countries, European Union uh, countries. Um, and by selecting them, they are basically saying that if uh, uh, a re-entry object uh, is predicted to overfly uh, this country during the, during the re-entry, uh, users will be notified, um, notified uh, of, uh, of this re-entry event. So basically, let's, uh, let's give the example that is there. We have chosen uh, the eight uh, EU member states that are part of the consortium. So if there is a, a future re-entry that is overflying um, uh, during the re-entry any, any, any of these countries, uh, users of the re-entry service will uh, receive an email notification that a new report uh, is available and that report will be available in the portal as I've shown uh, to, be, to be consulted. This configuration can be changed at uh, any time uh, according to the, the, to the user needs and this configuration affects mostly uh, the email notifications that the users uh, receive and the visibility of the re-entry reports in the portal. Uh, meaning all the reports um, are available for all the users of the re-entry service and they are kind of hidden based on this, uh, on this configuration. So if the user resets this configuration to uh, all the countries and also non-EU that is uh, uh, aggregated as a whole, uh, all re-entry reports will be visible for, uh, for the users. Just the email notifications uh, are only sent according to the applicable and current uh, configuration for, uh, for each user. As, uh, as Moreno mentioned, uh, last year, uh, during the, what, we call, what, we, what we call the Tiangong re-entry campaign uh, that was uh, um, uh, done by the consortium, we created a, a dedicated uh, event page uh, in the portal um, with uh, extra information, more, uh, more uh, detailed information about the, uh, the object, the event itself. In this page there were also available uh, the re-entry reports as soon as they were being, uh, being produced. In uh, conclusion, a wrap-up of the re-entry service. Um, we intend to provide uh, autonomous products, autonomous re-entry reports based on the data that is uh, gathered by the USST contributing uh, sensors. Um, each of these products uh, describes and characterizes the uh, object overflight passes during the, the re-entry predicted uh, window. Uh, users have the possibility of configuring a geographical area of interest uh, to filter uh, the email notifications and also the visibility of the products uh, in the portal. And um, there's also uh, available in certain cases for mediatic events uh, extra information in what we call the, this uh, uh, ad hoc information on mediatic events. I pass the floor now again to Nina. Thank you so much, Elena, Moreno, and Pablo. So, as Pablo said, we will now start with the explanation of the fragmentation analysis service. And I will pass the floor again to Elena to start with that. Okay. Hello again. And uh, last but not least, uh, the fragmentation analysis service, which is the third service provided by the USST consortium. Uh, this service uh, um, has uh, the objective to provide uh, to the users uh, the detection, the confirmation and all the related information of the fragmentation events uh, whenever they occur. This uh, service receives input both from internal, the European partners, but also from external partners such as the US. So, uh, what are the products uh, of uh, this service? Um, um, just a short remark uh, before uh, to start talking about the products uh, of the fragmentation service. The current uh, service portfolio forces for the fragmentation service just uh, two products. 
the short term report and the medium term report. Um, but uh, at the very beginning of uh, 2020, um, is expected a release of this uh, service portfolio. And in this release, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> sorry, um, there are uh, major improvements expected for the fragmentation service. And um, in this uh, new release, the fragmentation service foresees three different products short term uh, notification, the medium term report, and the long term report. The short term uh, product is just an email notification uh, sent to the user as soon as the fragmentation is detected and confirmed by the OC in charge. Then uh, for the following three weeks uh, after the fragmentation detection, uh, the um, uh, OC in charge provides the medium term report, uh, which is of course updated every time we have additional information. Then for the three months following the fragmentation detection, we provide the long term report with additional analysis and um, uh, in-depth uh, um, uh, post-processing of the fragmentation event. Also for the fragmentation service, all the sensors contributing to the USST network are actively tasked by the um, OC in charge and their contribution is expected in order to produce uh, um, autonomous product. In addition to these uh, three uh, general products for um, special events such as has been the um, Microsoft Air fragmentation, we can uh, uh, provide in the portal uh, dedicated um, event pages. Then, uh, which is the, uh, the provision mechanism of the fragmentation analysis service? Um, um, as I said before, the OC in charge receive uh, input uh, coming from the um, European member states, uh, um, but also from external partners in the form of uh, fragmentation messages. Uh, whenever there is a fragmentation event, in charge send a tasking request to the other OC of the USST consortium in order to have additional data to characterize the fragmentation event, to catalog the new fragment and to generate when possible autonomous products. Then these products through the front desk are provided to the users as is shown in the right part of the slide. And uh, now, uh, again, I uh, pass the floor to Moreno, and he will explain to you what is uh, contained exactly in uh, these uh, three products expected for the fragmentation service. Thank you, Elena. Uh, so, uh, focusing on products and uh, starting from the short-term notification, you have to know that in this uh, email that you will receive, you will find uh, a general information about the event that we can try to release as soon as uh, uh, we uh, assess uh, that uh, a fragmentation event uh, actually happened. Uh, so you, you find, uh, find the type of, of fragmentation. So if we, if we got uh, a release of fragments or a collision or an ASAT, uh, you, would, uh, you would know also what kind of objects were involved in the fragmentation. So payloads, rocket bodies, and then information about the orbital regime of objects involved in order to assess if that kind of event can actually affect your own uh, spacecraft or your own uh, area of interest uh, in some or or orbital regime. Uh, sometimes we are also able to give you the number of fragments that uh, were detected uh, just uh, uh, right after the event. Then, in the following three weeks, we try to um, produce one or more uh, medium-term reports. In uh, the medium-term report, we are going to uh, provide you uh, some more information like uh, the distribution of the fragments uh, by means of a Gabbard diagram, uh, some 3D plots uh, with the distribution of the cloud, uh, the orbits that were involved in the event, uh, and also the dispersion of the uh, orbital parameters of the fragments. Uh, this is something that we have done in the past for several events, like the Microsoft uh, R uh, ASAT that were mentioned before. And then, in the future, we are going to uh, provide also the long-term report. So, uh, in the following three months, we are going to uh, produce a simulation on uh, the event and try to uh, compare the simulation with the real event and uh, giving, give to you uh, like uh, many uh, 
materials and many analyses like the area over mass, over mass uh, distribution, uh, the dispersion of the velocity of the fragments, uh, the spatial density distribution and the evolution over time. And also we are going to provide you the distribution of the fragments uh, uh, taking into account their sites. As real case, we are, uh, we are showing you the Microsoft R that was uh, an Indian ASAT uh, that uh, happened last March this year. And uh, you can see some products that we are able to produce, like the Gabbard diagram, and uh, also again a dedicated web page with more analysis and more details on the event. And also we are showing you some nice picture of the cloud when uh, it passed over a, in this case, a B-static radar, and also on, over uh, some telescopes that were able to retrieve uh, orbital information about the cloud. And then again, the floor is for uh, Paolo. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Moreno. Um, so now, uh, for the fragmentation service, uh, I will also show you um, how can you find in the portal, uh, how can you access the fragmentation service um, information. Again, in the dashboard, in the top menu, there is a, a fragmentation uh, entry. Uh, by clicking in this entry, you will see uh, a link to the fragmentation events page and also a link for any of the fragmentation uh, event dedicated pages that uh, we have available uh, in the portal. Um, again, in the timeline, uh, it's possible to select any fragmentation uh, event and see it uh, in a summarized way as it is uh, right now being shown uh, in, the, um, in the screen with, uh, with some basic information uh, about the, the, the fragmentation uh, event. Um, <coughs> also, uh, as before, there is a, a, a list of uh, 10, in this case, past fragmentation events, of course, uh, that can be seen in also in the, um, in the dashboard for, uh, uh, for information. Um, I didn't mention before, but in this list of events in the dashboard, uh, if you click in the identifier of one of the events, you can go directly to the, um, to the event page. And uh, there is also uh, in, the, in the dashboard uh, a bit highlighted, uh, since those were uh, mediatic events, as we called it, uh, the Indian Assad that happened uh, in late March uh, this year, and also um, um, a breakup uh, that happened in the geotransfer uh, orbit regime. Um, also, it was a, it was a, a nice event. Uh, and the mediatic one that was uh, closely followed by the, by the consortium and two dedicated uh, fragmentation event pages were uh, made available with more detailed information to the, um, uh, to the users. Going to the fragmentation events page on the, on the top, uh, it's a similar page as for collision and, uh, and for, uh, for re-entry. Um, we have the, the list of uh, fragmentation events, all the fragmentation events um, that, uh, that were detected and uh, monitored and characterized by the, by the consortium and which products have been created uh, to it. Uh, for, each, um, for each event, uh, we can see the number of products that, uh, that uh, uh, have been created. We can see the, the event uh, epoch uh, when it was, uh, uh, when roughly uh, uh, it was identified that uh, happened. Um, and also the number of fragments uh, that were basically uh, released or uh, uh, after, the, after the event, the fragmentation event. There is also identification of the, the, what we call the parent object, the one that uh, broke up or that collided and uh, resulted in, uh, in, in fragments um, in, this, uh, in this list. Uh, in particular, we can see there the, the Microsat R event that was mentioned uh, in Moreno's, uh, Moreno's slides that was uh, followed by the, by the consortium. If we go into the details of this uh, fragmentation event, we can see uh, in the bottom of, sl of the slide the list of the products that were uh, produced by the uh, responsible operational center uh, for this particular Indian Asat uh, um, event. 
Uh, we have, I think, uh, seven, there were seven re fragmentation reports uh, created with, uh, with updated information uh, along the time. For example, uh, we can see that uh, the, the number of fragments initially uh, was, was lower than the, the, the number of fragments in the end. So more fragments were possible to be uh, detected, identified. So that, uh, that was the reason of this, uh, uh, of this update. Here in this page, it's also possible, as uh, for the other uh, services, to download uh, the fragmentation reports so you can have them um, for any offline analysis that, uh, um, that you want to, to do. Again, in the dashboard uh, and focus on the, on the access to the fragmentation uh, dedicated uh, event pages, the, it can be done either in that pop-up on the right, as I mentioned before, or also in the top menu uh, under fragmentations. There, is, uh, uh, there are links for uh, each of the fragmentation dedicated, dedicated event pages uh, with extra information on these uh, particular uh, events. Um, this is an example of the Indian Asat uh, uh, fragmentation event dedicated page. Uh, in it, you can find uh, extra information uh, about the event, uh, also uh, a video with a simulation of the, uh, of the cloud of fragments, all the reports that have been produced, and most importantly, uh, the consortium produced a special um, fragmentation analysis technical note that is accessible in this page and can be downloaded with uh, um, a, a, a more in-depth and uh, expert analysis done uh, about this event with all the information in this uh, particular technical note, which um, is exemplified here also in the, in the screen. Um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't mention it before for re-entry and, and now for fragmentation, but it's also important to mention that the application programmatic uh, uh, interface is also available for fragmentation and re-entry products. Uh, maybe not so relevant, but uh, all the re-entry reports and fragmentation reports can also be um, accessed, downloaded, uh, in a more system-to-system -system interface through the, uh, through the API. And now, wrapping up the conclusions for this uh, particular service, uh, again, uh, it is uh, the intention to provide uh, as much as possible autonomous products based on uh, uh, USST uh, contributing, contributing sensors uh, gathered data. Um, for this particular service, uh, um, the operational center performs uh, an advanced analysis uh, during the, the next three months of the confirmation of the event and updates this information to the users by the means of the medium-term and the long-term reports uh, that my colleagues uh, described. And last but not least, as for the, the, the previous cases, uh, we provide uh, ad hoc information by means of uh, um, dedicated pages in the portal uh, where mediatic events are, uh, are related. And now, pass again the floor to Nina. Thank you very much again, Elena, Moreno and Paolo. And we will now start the questions and answers session. So thank you very much for all the questions you have been sending to us. Let's start with the first one. This is a general question. So, Amelie, if you could be so kind to answer that one. It says, what is the future of EUSST? All right, so thank you very much. I think this is a, indeed a general question and an interesting one. As I was mentioning, we are quite a recent project. I mean, it's been three years since we've been providing the services, so we know how to work. Um, we, we've improved a lot and we've learned to work together, to cooperate together. Uh, so I think my first answer would be that we need to continue that. This is uh, the, the immediate future. Um, we've, uh, we've been speaking a lot about autonomous products, sharing data, increasing the availability of sensors. Uh, this is a particular effort that we are having right now um, in the sense that uh, we know that we will have a network of sensors uh, that we try to optimize, that we try to have as efficient as possible. Uh, and so we will have more and more data. So uh, there is a commitment from all the members of the consortium to more and more share data in the future. It is something already that we do. But of course, uh, in the future, we, we have to continue this effort uh, to continue on the database setting up, uh, to continue the work on the setting up of the precursor catalog, 
So we really want to progress in, in that direction. And ultimately, the objective is not to share data among ourselves simply, but also to provide uh, accurate services, efficient services, uh, like uh, tailor-made. In, in French, we say haute couture, you know, something you know, that we can uh, tailor to the, to the needs of the users. Um, and this is an effort that we will continue, definitely, uh, based also on the feedbacks that we receive, uh, on, the, on the improvements that we can foresee from ourselves. So I would say the future of EU SST in that sense is uh, really on the operational part. We've been doing well, we think so, and we know that we can also further progress, in particular by regularly uh, sharing data, improving the services, and improving the links uh, towards the users. Um, there is also this work on the sensor architecture, which has to be continued and, uh, and performed in the months, uh, in the months to come. Uh, because we know that uh, we also have this network of sensors that we need to optimize and, and provide best value for money also for, for the European Union and increase this level of autonomy in any case. Um, so I think the first part of the answer would be that one. Then for uh, a more medium-term future, we also have the new space regulation, which is in the preparation at uh, the European Union level. So as a consortium, we are... Uh, um, we are still trying to uh, assess or analyze what's going to, be hap what's going to happen for us. Uh, the, the regulation is still under negotiation also at, uh, uh, at the European Union level uh, from the Council and the Parliament. So this is not over. We don't have a final text. But we know that we will have something called SSA, uh, an SSA program. That, that case, it's going to be a program and not anymore a support framework as it was uh, mentioned in the beginning. Uh, so we know we will evolve into a dedicated program, just like Galileo, Copernicus, uh, GovSatcom. So this is an important signal that SSA will matter in the future, and uh, we are ready for this uh, change. Uh, then we need to see under which uh, uh, basis we will be working together, uh, how we will evolve from, from a consortium to this new step uh, of the SSA program. Um, so everything is now under negotiation. We need to see. Um, but definitely we we'll be ready to, to make this transition into the future. And probably the last uh, part of the answer uh, is uh, to continue what we've already been doing uh, also, is to participate to the dialogues, the exchanges, the discussions, uh, to participate to forums, to conferences, to explain what we do and to engage into a dialogue also with our uh, other partners at the international level. Um, I'm thinking in particular about the U.S. Uh, because, of course, uh, you will have probably understood that we are not... Uh, uh, autonomy doesn't mean complete independence. We are relying on the U.S. and this is a, also a cooperation and a collaboration with the U.S. So we also intend to enter into a dialogue with the U.S., further dialogue. We've already done that quite a lot. We meet regularly with the U.S. Um, with the 18 Space Squadron, with the different departments, Department of Commerce, Department of States, DOD, Department of Defense. And we know this is an important dialogue that we also have to continue in the future to uh, learn from each other, uh, brief each other on our recent or res respective national for the U.S. and European developments for us. Um, and this is also a way for us to be a credible actor in this SSA landscape as a whole, SST in particular. Uh, to be a credible partner uh, and to work uh, as efficiently as possible together. I am mentioning the U.S. There might be some other opportunities, but uh, we are present in, uh, in other forums, so we hope to be able to continue that. So to wrap up, maybe internally we know we can uh, even improve uh, our services, uh, our way of sharing data, our way of working together, uh, or let's say continue what we've been doing so far. At EU level, there are many things which are going on, and there will be some evolutions in the, in the years to come, so we get prepared for that and to ensure the transition. And also, um, at a more international level, I guess uh, we have also a voice <laughs> to, to raise or to engage, um, in particular, vis-à-vis -vis our U.S. partners and other partners around the world. Thank you so much, Amelie, for Welcome. this very interesting answer. Now, let us pass to the second question which is related to users. So, Paolo, if you could be so kind to answer that one. It says, you mentioned that the SSD services are user-oriented. What does that mean? That's a, an interesting question. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, basically, we, we intend uh, and we have been trying to gather as much as possible 
um, user needs regarding the, um, the services that we intend to provide and how to consolidate and to evolve these services. Uh, we have a set of uh, what we call user interaction mechanism um, uh, activities um, that are, uh, are executed in order to get, um, on one hand, uh, feedback about the current services uh, from, uh, from you, from the users, and also um, ideas, requirements, uh, needs uh, for these three services that you would, would like to see uh, implemented that fit more or in a better way uh, your, own, uh, your own needs. This is done um, through, for example, for the collision avoidance service through bilateral meetings uh, of, the, of the cooperation uh, with each of the users um, in order to discuss not only the service configuration document uh, criteria, but in particular uh, any, any user need or requirement or uh, customization, uh, if I may say, that a CA user uh, would like to see uh, on the service, CA service provisioning. Um, um, users can always uh, provide uh, proactive feedback uh, to, to be taken into account or, or user needs through the USST help desk contact, uh, uh, contacts, either the email or the, or the phone number. Um, we also, um, uh, as, a, as a consortium, as a corporation, are uh, actively present in uh, different conferences or uh, other kinds of events that are, that are relevant. For example, the, um, um, there was a, an event at the EU Civil Protection Forum uh, where we were present trying to understand a bit better uh, any user needs or requirements for the, for the re-entry service. Um, and uh, regularly, normally uh, every year, we execute a user feedback campaign, uh, a formal user feedback campaign structured, and uh, uh, we ask the users uh, 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 formally to provide us uh, feedback about uh, the USSTS general, in general, uh, about each of the particular services, and also about the, the front desk. So, in summary, with all these uh, uh, user interaction mechanism uh, uh, activities and uh, intention to, to accommodate um, the user requirements and needs, we consider that the services are some kind of uh, user oriented. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paulo. You're welcome. Now let's move on to the third question. It's related to the collision avoidance service. So Florian and Cristina, if you could answer that one. It says, uh, space track is in the trial phase of the space fence. That shall increase the amount of objects tracked and presumably CDMs published. What are the plans slash work done by EUSST to face this new scenario? <coughs> okay. <coughs> so, uh, yes, uh, there will be more CDM at OC levels, but Present object uh, will be more uh, precisely known, and a new object will be likely not, uh, will not probably have a very good orbit. So, uh, we do not foresee a high increase of high interest events and, uh, in the future. So, for the, uh, for the user, we do not increase uh, more communication to other users. But indeed, on our, on, uh, at OC level, we will probably have, we will have more CDM, and uh, we have uh, made evolution on our hardware and on our software to take into account uh, this increase in, in terms of CDM. And if I may complement, we are in contact with the US, uh, with the Team Space Squadron, in order to better understand how they are going to provide these uh, CDNs, this increase in the CDNs. They always tell us that it's not going to be uh, like you are going to receive one million CDNs more in one day, no? They are going to do it step by step, so we are in contact with them and we are getting ready for, for this situation that we are fully aware of. Okay. Thank you very much, Florian and Cristina. Now let's pass on to the fourth question which is related to the re-entry service. So if Morena and Elena, if you could answer this one, please. It says, who is mainly interested in re-entry analysis services, civil or military entities? I can 
answer. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question because it depends on the point of view because for sure the civilian protection inside the every nation I think that could be interesting in uh, that kind of uh, events. For instance, uh, if you have an area with a, a nuclear central or if you have an area with a, an high density populated area in your country, probably as a civil protection you would, uh, you would understand better what is going on in the, the re-enter uh, part of the service. Uh, but I think that also the military uh, could be interested in because of our, uh, uh, our mission abroad or our facility inside our nation. So uh, I think that uh, both, of the, both of the civilian and uh, the military part could be interested in uh, register to the, to the re-entry service for, uh, for the future. Okay. Thank you very much. What? Now, the next question is a general question, so I believe you could answer that, please. It says, we see an increasing interest of private companies to provide SST commercial services. It, it is true in the U.S., but also in some EU countries. Is EU SST planning to partially rely in future on such commercial services? So, thank you for the question. Um, again, this is a, again a very interesting one. We are aware of that trend. Um, I presented at the beginning uh, that we are a, a consortium of member states. So we have been structured around member states entities, space agencies, and public entities. So in our current setup, let's say, um, the, the private um, people are not, let's say, part of uh, the scheme or the, um, the visible scheme of our governance or our setup. However, um, I would like to, to precise first that uh, private companies or industries or private bodies in general are involved in our activities uh, and other levels. Um, so if you remember the, the, the governance or the way I presented uh, our organization, there are different layers of, uh, of governance. Um, so we are working from very tiny tasks to the, to the steering committee. Uh, and also there are many, many activities. We are structured among work packages and tasks. There are dozens of tasks and dozens of work packages. Um, and for each of those tasks and work packages, we have activities behind. Some activities are performed by the space agencies, uh, by the operation centers and so on. Uh, and some activities are subcontracted uh, to different actors and among those actors, uh, private companies, private industries. Um, I know that for, this is not homogeneous uh, for each of the partners. Uh, there are some countries which rely a lot on their industry, uh, also as part of the operational uh, centers uh, activities. For some other partners, this is, not, uh, this is not the same case. This is also because we come from different uh, histories, different uh, legacies, uh, different ways of organizing this SSA domain nationally. So coming back to the question, I would try to say that um, from this level of uh, detail or granularity, uh, the private industry is somehow involved in the way we work. And for some cases, it's uh, usually involved in the way we work. Uh, they are participating a lot. They are helping us a lot, developing hardware, developing softwares, algorithms, and so on. Uh, so we are aware of the trend uh, towards the, the commercial uh, services to be provided. We are aware that this is a general trend also for, uh, from the US. Um, we are attentive to this evolution. Um, we have uh, different, different ways of organizing our activities. There are the purely operational ways. So how do we provide the services concretely and uh, on a daily basis because we have this responsibility. Uh, we also have some activities to think about the future, to think about how we can improve ourselves, uh, to make some R&D activities, studies, and so on. And as part of these activities, we also know that we can give space then to our industries to, for them to suggest ways of doing things differently, ways of improving um, our, our way of working. So I would say that so far, <laughs> as per the scheme, um, industries is already embedded into our activities. Um, 
two or more or, or important degrees or not, depending on the member states. In any case, they are evolved also uh, thanks to the studies, thanks to the, the different links that we can entertain with them. They are also involved uh, in the way we can progress uh, altogether. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, this is, a, this is the answer I would make to this question. Thank you very much, Amelie. Okay, the next question, let's move on to the next question, is related to the collision avoidance service. So if Louis and Christina could answer that. It says, in case of a legal conjunction triggered by USCDM, have you been able to reassess the event sever severity level from alert down to warning slash info thanks to the data provided by European sensors? So it depends on the conjunction, because with our current means, we can see medium or big objects. As, uh, whereas the most of Leo conjunction involve small objects. But uh, we, in the past, we had conjunction with US data only, US and USST data, or USST data only. And uh, yes, uh, we could have happened that sometime uh, for, the, for the conjunction uh, where we are data coming from the US and from USST, we look at both uh, solutions and we assess the risk. Uh, we assess the risk using both solutions. So uh, we do we decrease the risk level on. Uh, US data only, on uh, USCT data only, it could, have, it could have happened in the past, but we always look closely at all source of data. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to the next question. It's related to users, so Paolo, if you could answer that one, please. It says, is there any contractual relationship with the users? Um, <coughs> actually, no. Um, the, the SST decision, uh, as uh, pointed out initially by, by Amelie, uh, clearly states that uh, um, European Commission, uh, any of the member states or, or even um, uh, SATSEM, uh, are not uh, to be held liable uh, for any damage that might, uh, might occur um, in the consequence of uh, an interruption of the provision of, of the SST services or any inaccuracy of the of the provided uh, information. So um, this is uh, these are services that are uh, uh, on one hand uh, free of charge, and we do uh, all our best to provide the uh, the most accurate and timely uh, information regarding the three services um, to to the users. But as a, as an initial statement, uh, it is said up front that uh, uh, we have. We should not be held liable uh, for, any co for any consequence. For example, in the end, as mentioned before, uh, regarding the CA service, um, the, the operational centers provide uh, all the updated information regarding the risk uh, to the satellite operators, even support them on defining any potential um, um, avoidance maneuver uh, to mitigate the risk, but it's uh, up to the operators, the satellite operators, to take the final decision whether to move or not based on all the information they have available, namely from uh, USST. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Next question is related to the re-entry service. It says, how many re-entries were detected by the EUSST in the last year? Um, I would say that um, uh, starting from April 2019, the OC in charge of the, of the re-entry and fragmentation, uh, it's the Italian one. Uh, so actually, if we speak of fragmentation, right? Uh, re-entry, the re-entry, re okay. On the re-entry, I would say that um, since April, we, we have something like 30, 35 uh, uh, events for re-entry and uh, actually they were uh, screened by, uh, by means 
the comparison between our catalog and the US information. So sometimes uh, we are able to detect an, an event that are not uh, communicated by nobody, but then uh, by means of observations and analysis, uh, we are pretty confident that the object is going to re-enter, so we deliver the report also uh, if we have no other source of information. So sometimes it uh, can happen. I, I don't remember exactly the number. I can, uh, I can check uh, offline. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Next question, which is a general one, so for Amelie. It says, it is understood that EUSST services will remain for free also in the future. Could you confirm, please? <laughs> well, I wish I have a crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I can tell is that this is true, that they are currently free of charge and available 24-7. I was mentioning that in my presentation. Um, the current um, draft space regulation does not foresee any change in this uh, free provision of services. Um, and also we, as a consortium, we also acknowledge that uh, this free provision of services is something important because it is also a shared responsibility um, that we are able to collectively protect our space environment. So making things um, with fees, available with fees, um, it would probably restrict uh, the capacity of the actors to, or at least it would make an effort, an extra effort for them to have access. So we've understood this free access to EUSST services as a way also to contribute to the general endeavor of protecting our space environment, as everybody recognizes, and as, you, uh, as it is also said in the decision. Uh, the EU itself recognized that uh, this is a, a common good, so we have to protect it and we have to do it uh, on a collective way. So again, free services is uh, one of the ways <laughs> to, to do that in a simple and, uh, um, and let's say, uh, as free as possible <laughs> way. So, uh, so far, yes, the services will remain free in Europe. In Europe. Thank you very much, Amelie. Okay, now related to the re-entry service is the next question. So Moreno and Elena, if you could answer that one. It says, is it possible that the value reported as max latitude in the re-entry summary page is on truth the inclination of the orbit? Yeah, actually it's related to the inclination of the orbits. So uh, in some way you have, uh, you have the information reported in another uh, in another format, but it's, uh, it's the same. It's the, the inclination of the orbit, and uh, by means of that, you can assess uh, what is the maximum latitude that can be reached by the object. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Next question. It's related to the collision avoidance service, so Florian and Cristina. It says, how the data provided by users for the collision avoidance service is used by the operational centers. Vital, I think, it's like we receive different information from the users. The first one is the ephemeris. We receive it uh, through the portal, and we include it in our reassessment of the, of the risk. So we use it for generating these uh, the four different types of CDNs. So we always replace the, the orbit the, of the primary with the owner operator orbit. The second information that we receive is the maneuver plan. So we incorporate this information that could be together with the ephemerides or, or not. So we include this information in our computation. Uh, we also receive this information through the, through the portal. Um, we have then the, the third information that we receive is ad hoc uh, ephemerides when you would like to avoid a risk. Uh, you can send us, a, a, let's say, a fake uh, maneuver uh, ephemeris and we include in our ad hoc screening so we can reassess if, the, if this maneuver is a good idea or if, a, of, is, or if it's not uh, so good. So I think this is all the information that we receive and we incorporate it in the operational centers, uh, but in any case we have this direct link uh, when there is high interest events, so we are constantly and permanently in touch when, when it comes to an alert level. Thank you very much, Cristina. Okay, the next question is a general one. 
So I'm going to leave you could be so kind to answer that one. It says, what is the relation between EUSST and ESA SSA programs? Right. So the, the question of um, the relation with, uh, with ESA, I would say, I would try to, to start my answer like for the industry. We are a consortium of member states. We are coming from a European Union decision uh, from, the, uh, from the European Parliament and from the Council. And so as part of our general organization, ESA is not part of our structure. Um, so ESA is not part of the SS EU SST capability per se. Um, however, we are member states also party forming part of ESA at some point, and this is a busy week for all of us. Um, so we are member states of ESA, and so there are links, um, indirect links, also between the activities that we are performing um, nationally, contributing to the EU SST consortium activities, and activities which are done via ESA. Um, the decision 501, for instance, mentions about the sensor function. Uh, that uh, it is, this sensor function is consisting of a network of uh, member states' ground-based um, sensors, including national sensors developed through ESA uh, to survey and track space objects. So I was quoting the, the decision 501, which gives such a place for ESA as the, the opportunity via the member states' national activities as part of the program board of ESA, the program board ESA, uh, SSA, uh, to indirectly contribute to, to what we've done, what we've been doing uh, inside the USST consortium. So there are links, more on the research and development part for, for ESA, um, and there is this place recognized by the decision for a national sensor which can be developed through ESA. Apart from that, um, the setting up of our consortium again is a consortium of EU member states, from the European Union institutions. So they are, uh, there is a kind of separation between this setup and the ESA setup. Mm -hmm. But of course, this is a gray zone. <laughs> there are links, definitely. And fortunately, there are links. Thank you very much, Amelie. OK, next question. It's related to the Collision Avoidance Service. It says, what is the frequency of notifications to the users in case of a high interest event? Uh, so, uh, it depends on the updates and on uh, the time to TCA remaining. But once uh, VOC notify the user for an high interest event by mail or by phone, uh, he will receive at least one update per day. Uh, and more, see if uh, we have uh, more, um, more, more information to, to provide. And if a mitigation action is needed, we will, have, uh, we will communicate by mail uh, to provide a maneuver. The user will say, will tell us if a maneuver, if he can perform this kind of maneuver or if he need to move this maneuver at another, at another orbital position, at another, at, on another orbit. So we will interact uh, to, um, to define the best maneuver, taking into account the user constraint and which, um, of course, avoid the risk. Then we will perform a first screen at OSI level to test if this maneuver uh, avoid, um, um, do, does not generate other risk. The user will then send uh, us a new ephemeris uh, containing this maneuver, this maneuver. We will screen it um, against, uh, so against the wall catalog. We will provide on the portal new product, new CDM, and uh, once uh, we are sure that uh, the maneuver avoids the risk, then the user can um, upload it on its uh, spacecraft. So basically, uh, once we are on uh, survey mode, I would say uh, we are generally at one update per day, and uh, if needed, uh, during the last or the two last day, uh, it can be uh, two, three, five, ten days per day, per day, per day until the, the solution is, uh, is found. 
And you can always contact us in the on-call yes. phones because both OCs have 24-7 on-call teams. So if you have any question or if you would like to contact the OC because you have any uh, doubt, you can always call the on-call team and we will answer as soon as possible, indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now we have two questions, uh, two, sorry, two minutes left for the questions and answers. So the next question is also for Amelie. It says, what may be the impact of Brexit? Are there new potential partners in the consortium? Thank you in advance. <laughs> so Brexit. Again, I wish I have a crystal ball. <laughs> this is, well, so far what I can say is that uh, the UK is part of the European Union. As such, the UK is part of the USSD consortium. Uh, so, so far, no change. And uh, so this is the, the current situation. As a consortium, we are closely monitoring uh, the political developments around the UK situation. Um, this is something which is uh, far above our shoulders. However, we are getting prepared and we are monitoring that closely. Um, this, we will apply any high-level political decision and any uh, instruction that we will be given uh, once those decisions will be taken. Uh, the consequences of the UK departing the consortium, also in terms of sensors availability, contribution to the services and so on, this is also something we monitor for sure. We are trying to get prepared in case they cannot contribute anymore. But again, so far, there is no change in the situation. We are vigilant. Um, we will need to check uh, what, is, uh, what will be the impact on the, uh, on the users, because uh, as I mentioned in the decision, uh, the, the users mentioned are European Union users. So um, we will, again, remain uh, attentive to what uh, can happen. Um, we will apply any political decision that, uh, that concerns us. Uh, and of course, we will also be prepared to provide support to the current uh, UK users to answer questions. Um, you, can, uh, you can, of course, reach us uh, in case you have any, any question. Um, but this is, to, to a certain extent, to a political level, <laughs> above our shoulders. So, yeah, in keywords, uh, we are vigilant, we are preparing, and we will uh, adapt ourselves as usual. Okay, thank you very much. Last question is also for Amelie. <laughs> it says, what is the added value of the SSC services compared to similar existing services? All right. Um, I would try to say, maybe on two levels. Um, I will take the example of the US because we've been mentioning that several times we are comparing to the, to the US and to the US services. It's true that we are based on US CDMs, for, in particular for the CA service, uh, also for alerts as part of the re-entry and fragmentation services. But we can complement uh, through our uh, sensors, our network of sensors. We can refine the orbit of secondary objects. We can derive from all those CDMs the high interest events, the interest events, and so on. Um, as just mentioned by Florian and Christina, we are able to have a very strong link with the users um, to directly interact with them in order to provide them some guidance, uh, even, them, even though they are responsible in the end, those users, for the maneuvers, potential maneuvers. But we have this capacity as an USST consortium coming to use this data coming from the US, which we acknowledge as good quality, and to refine it, to complement it, to offer this uh, tailor-made service to our users. Uh, I was mentioning haute couture, I think this is something we can say. Same for the re-entry and fragmentation services. Uh, you've been given some examples of how we are able to tailor those uh, services regarding uh, the uh, areas of interest and so on and so forth. So I think here we are able to provide an added value uh, compared to the US, for instance. Uh, this is also uh, an exercise of um, burden sharing at some point. We are also contributing to the safety of uh, the space environment and space activities in general. And then maybe the other layer of the answer is uh, what do we do differently from individual member states? Uh, what is the added value of having a consortium of member states? And there I would say that uh, European cooperation matters. Uh, we, are, we have learned to work 
among each other, to share best practices, to improve collectively based on our legacies, based on our strengths, um, in order to, to improve collectively. So this European co cooperation means something. We have quite a unique governance model, that's, that's true, uh, which has to uh, make cooperate among different member states altogether, different space agencies, different setups. So we share data, we have people responsible for all this data. Um, we try to focus on our strengths and also to have a backup uh, in order again to collectively progress, so to lend support. We are trying to make best use of uh, the EU money to, to prepare the future, to look at future architecture, to optimize our future network, uh, to be careful about our investments. So I would say that in that, in that sense also we are providing added value as an EU SST consortium compared to the efforts of individual member states. So we hope to be able to uh, continue this work, to progress collectively and to share uh, European, um, uh, let's say, aspects of the SST domain as a real added value. Thank you very much, Emily. Welcome. And thanks to all of you for all your answers. Thanks to you for your questions. And now let's pass on to the wrap up and conclusions. Now, the EUSSD support framework was established in 2014 to ensure the long-term availability of European and national space infrastructure facilities and services, which are essential for the economies, societies and citizens in Europe. Currently, EU, uh, eight EU member states uh, and the EU SATSEN are cooperating in the provision of the SST services, which are, again, collision avoidance, re-entry analysis, and fragmentation analysis. The EUSSD front desk is the main interface towards the users for the provision of services and user support. Now, I remi uh, remind you again, this, this was only the first of a series of webinars, and um, that access to SST services can be requested through the EUSSD portal at sst.setson.europa.eu. Today we have had 92 participants, so thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, and of course, we hope to see you again at the next EUSST webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>